Hi there, my name is Samina Chaudhry Khan. I'm a hospitalist, I'm a physician. Um, I was married to a physician, an intensivist, and I wanted to talk to you today about the importance of living well. And here's my story. My husband was uh, an intensivist, very conscientious about his health. And he was the youngest of his siblings. There were eight. The oldest one passed away with a heart attack. So my husband was really into exercising, keeping his health well. He would work out three times a week. And suddenly just one day, um, I got a call from him. He had gone to the gym and sometimes he would get a little nausea after overdoing his exercise. And when I heard him calling, I knew he was calling either from the gym or home. He said he was back home and he wanted me to come home suddenly, just right now as soon as I could. And I asked him what happened and he wouldn't give me any more information. So I rushed home. And when I, when I came home, but I found him in bed. Um, I had called his name and he gave a big moan so I rushed into the bedroom and he was in the bed um, with his face blue. I tried to um, call his name, shake him, and he would not. And I could understand from the bottle of aspirin sitting by him, he probably was having a chest pain and he must have taken it. Um, I started to resuscitate him, got panicky. And then I called 911. When uh, the paramedics came, they tried to resuscitate him. He, they could not. Uh, they intubated him, took him to the hospital, and they kept doing the CPR for as long as they could. By the time I reached the hospital, I was told that they could not revive him. And uh, at that moment, I just didn't know what to do. I just, just went blank. Um, tried to get my kids together, asked my neighbors to go pick the kids up and brought them home, tried to call his family, his sisters live around here, and tried to get them to come to, to, to help out because I just didn't know what to do. Um, I had to deal with the kids, deal with the, the tragedy itself, and after a few days, I realized I also had to deal with the finances. There were no finances that were sought out. Either it would have his name, my name on the properties, or both our names, or just his name. So in that process, it took me a long time to really, really sort it out and I had to do that through a probation lawyer. I hired one, went through with her, with all the accounts and every property and everything. And whatever was not designated, which was mostly the case, we had to go through the probation process, which took a lot of time. And of course, the money I had to put into it to get the lawyer. After having dealt with that, um, I realized if all the property and the accounts were in a will or were in a trust, I wouldn't have to go through that process. It took me almost a year to fix and finish what I started with the probation lawyer because I had to take the probation uh, papers to every account that was out there to change it, to designate it, or whatever I had to do for that. So along with the grief and with my children to support them, this was a third process that I had to go through 
that I didn't even have an idea could have been dealt better. If I had a living will, or my husband had a living will, or there was a trust. So at that point, I did decide to make it easier for my children. Whenever I leave, they would have a will, they would have a trust, so they won't have to go through the probation process. Because believe me, it's an extra burden at the time when you have to face it. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Felicia. A couple of years ago, my mother passed away, and um, fortunately for me, she left us in a good place. As everybody, my mother was relatively young. I didn't think anything would happen to her. About a month before she passed away, and my mother passed away from a massive heart attack. It was unexpected. Uh, she was deep sea fishing in Florida and collapsed, and there was nothing they could do for her. She was too far away from the banks for anyone to get to her. Um, but my mother called me about a month before passing away and she asked me one question. She says, Felicia, do you love me? And I said, of course, mom, you know I love you. She says, um, do you think your sister or yourself would be better for what I'm leaving you? And I told her, I said, mom, I don't need anything that you're leaving me. You gave me enough. You give whatever you have to whoever you want to have it. I will be okay with that. And so she hung up the phone. I didn't think anything else of it because she had been telling me for years where everything was, that there was going to be a letter and in it, it would tell me everything. Um, the lawyer had been would be contacted, um, the funeral home would be contacted, the burial would be taken place, and, and my mother was active duty army, so um, she was buried with the military. Um, but I got the call that my mother passed, and I didn't believe that it actually happened. But um, flooding with those emotions, I didn't have to worry, I had no fears because I remember all the conversations I would have with her that I had with her in the past about what she wanted, how she wanted it, where it was going to be. And it was exactly the way she had it. When I made it to Florida, I realized my mother had left me everything and she had amassed so much wealth secretly that I was beyond joy. I have a legacy to leave to my family, my children, because of the legacy my mother left me. It's just so important. I think about my mother all the time. All of the time. Because of what my mother did, putting her paperwork in order, notifying me year after year on what her plans were, updating the changes every year that she needed to do, it's made everything for me so much easier. I can go down to Florida and see about her, her burial, but everything's taken care of. I can go down to Florida and I can clean out her home, but where it should go was all taken care of. I can go to Florida and see the lawyer. Somehow he already knew that she had passed. She had taken care of everything. She had placed everything in order. I'm very grateful for that. No one should have to bury a loved one with that kind of grief and have to figure out all of those other things in a short period of time. I'm very grateful for what my mother did. Hi, my name is Loda and I'm a physician working in the area of geriatric medicine, which means a patient 65 and better, and also hospice and palliative medicine, which is patients at the end of life. As you watch this video, I have a question for you. What if something were to happen to you right now? What would happen to those you love the most? Have you made it easy for them to navigate the devastating loss 
of an acute illness or something even was happening and as they deal with that grief that loss other things are taken care of to make the stress less for them if you've done it I want to say congratulations because you're probably one of 36 percent of Americans that have done this and if you have not don't despair settle down watch this video and I'll walk you some of the things you need to have and the things you need to know to make the process easier well the first thing i'm going to talk about is advanced directive in advanced directive it's a legal document and you appoint a durable power of attorney for health care a durable power of attorney for finances and that is someone who's going to make decisions that align with the things you want done for you some people will appoint a decision maker especially in healthcare, that may make decisions for them even when they're able to now most times it's a different person that you use for healthcare and a different person for finances. But sometimes you may find um, some people using the same person for healthcare and finances. Now, what is a post form or a DNR? A DNR form is a do not resuscitate form that tells the medical provider what you want done. Whereas a post form, which is a physician order for life-sustaining treatment, also called a most form, medical order for life-sustaining treatment, also called a post form, physician order for scope of treatment, also called a most form, medical order for scope of treatment. It's the same form, but with different names, depending on what part of the nation you're in. Well, again, this is a physician order and it outlines what kind of treatment you want at the end of life. Now, the post form and the DNR forms are papers that are given to people who are at the end of life, terminally ill most times, but the advanced directive is a form that every adult should have. Now, there's a living will is also a legal document that you can have that works hand in hand almost with an advanced directive. The living will can be part of an advanced directive, a living will again will say the things you want done for you but it works in so much more detail it'll talk about mechanical ventilation it'll talk about having a tube in your stomach a gastrostomy tube it will talk about receiving dialysis it'll talk about antibiotic treatment it'll talk about um organ donation and so many more things so it goes into detail so that you get the care that you want not the care other people think you should have now let's talk about your last will and testament it's a legal document where you outline how you want your estate divided and you appoint an executor to help make sure that your wishes are carried out because guess what when you've walked when you've done things, whatever it is you've accumulated, you want to make sure that it goes to those you have worked for and not the people that the state deems that it should go to. And you want it executed by someone you trust and have appointed, not someone the state appoints for you. So what are some of the other things you need to have? As some people as they get older will have medical illness. Sometimes you're diabetic, hypertensive, heart failure, whatever it is. Find a safe spot where you outline who your physician is, what their phone number is, what medications you're taking, why you're taking those medications. And then think about insurance, your homeowner's insurance, your order insurance, life insurance policy if you have any, long-term care insurance, 
any kind of insurance you have, make copies of it and put it in a place that is easily accessible to those you want to have it. What about finance, bank account, stock, um, like a bond, whatever it is you have that you want people to know, put it in a safe space. Why? It makes the process so much easier. And finally, those you appoint, you just don't appoint people and they don't know you've appointed them. Appoint them, make sure they know. And when you put these things in writing, keep it in a place where people can find it. And sometimes, yes, let people know where these things are so that that process, when it's needed, it's easier. Too often in my line of work, I've seen families destroyed because things were not put in writing, because one child wanted to do this, the other child wanted to do that. And in the middle of grieving, there's bitterness, there's a family destroyed, and I'm sure that that's not the intent of those who have gone ahead. So this right now is your moment to do what you must to make it easier. It's a difficult conversation to have, but it's a conversation that is better early than late because one thing we're guaranteed in life, the only two guarantees we have is that we're gonna be, we're gonna be born and we are gonna die. We don't know all the other things that will happen in between. We don't know the time. So be prepared for that eventuality when it does happen now. If you've enjoyed this video, learn from it, share, leave comments below, and please subscribe. We need you.